gracious and loving God, may the words of my mouth and the meditations of all of our hearts be pleasing and acceptable in your sight. O Lord, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. Well, how many of you here have ever been in awe of someone or something? Only a handful? Really? I think some of you are missing out on life if you haven't Amen. been in awe of something. Have you ever just stopped to marvel or wonder at that person or that place in nature? Anybody? For some of you, perhaps you've marveled at a movie star that you couldn't believe you were finally getting to meet face to face. Or for some of you, perhaps it was a local hero who graced you with their presence. Or perhaps for some of you, it's your first love. Or perhaps some of you, it's a historical figure you wish you could meet. For me, I can remember being in awe of my cousin Ken. And at the time of my awe and wonder of him, we called him Chipper. Chipper was in the U.S. Army when I was born and was serving in Desert Storm. As a very young child, I can remember helping make cards and draw pictures and fix care packages to send him. And I can even remember going to the elementary school in our community before I was even old enough to go to school and helping celebrate him as one of our local heroes. Although I had never met Chipper face to face, I was in awe of him. I just knew that drawing all these pictures for him and seeing his pictures and getting letters in the mail knew that meant somehow he had to be this great man. And after one of his deployments, he showed up at our home to stay for a few days. And then I was really in awe. I stopped and stared at this man who'd only ever been in picture form to me, hover over me as this very tall young gentleman. I was so awe-stricken by him that I followed him everywhere he went. Most literally, I took steps right behind him. My parents tried their hardest to distract me and offer other things for me to do so that he could get a break but nothing worked. I can even remember laying outside of the bathroom door in the morning when he was getting ready and passing him notes, pictures, you know, just chicken scratch. And my cousin was so generous and kind to me that he would write something back and shove it back underneath the door. Awe, wonder, marvel. Those are things I often think we don't always imagine Jesus doing himself. For who would Jesus be in awe of? I mean, it is Jesus after all. Who out there would make Jesus stop in his tracks and be in awe of him? Our scripture this morning says that Jesus marveled at the faith of a man. In order for Jesus to do that, that must be some amazing person. It must be someone like a great rabbi. But no. How about a great disciple, but not? Or even a great saint from his faith, like Elijah, but no. The man who left Jesus marveling at his faith was a century. A person that no one expected to capture Jesus' attention. The one who had great power, control, and wealth in the Roman Empire did just that. One source I was reading this week elaborates on the particulars as to why the centurion would not be who we expect Jesus to be marveled at. He says the centurion was one of the most unlikely persons to amaze Jesus. He was a Gentile, and there's no doubt that he had a pagan upbringing. He was a Roman, stationed in Palestine to subject the Jews to the emperor's rule. He was a man of war. He achieved the rank of centurion by distinguishing himself above others in the brutal Roman martial arts. Not exactly the resume you'd expect for becoming one of the Bible great heroes of our faith. John Piper continues to say that it was odd and unexpected for a Roman soldier and a Jew to have an encounter like this. It was very unusual because Jewish leaders were not in the habit of being fond of Roman soldiers. Feeling the obvious oddness of the request, we can see in scripture that one of the elders quickly added, he is worthy to 
have you do this for him. For he loves our nation. He is the one who built us our synagogue. This was so, but this was also unusual because Roman soldiers were not fond or in the habit of being around Jews in a positive way. Jesus discerned the Father's hand in this, and so he set off with them to the centurion's home. He had also just come off of a mountain where he <coughs> preached perhaps one of the most famous sermons about loving one's enemies. And this was something he wanted to encourage. So as they neared the house that day, another group of friends intercepted them. There was a brief huddled mass with a brief conference taking place with the elders. There were hushed, earnest voices. The elders perhaps seemed confused and concerned. Some observers, Piper says, probably thought the servant must have died. And then a representative from the group steps over to Jesus and says respectfully, Teacher, I have a message. A message for my Roman friend. And he says, Lord, do not trouble yourself, for I am not worthy to have you come under my roof. Therefore, I did not presume to come to you. But say the word and let my servant be healed. For I too am a man set under authority, with soldiers under me. And I say to one, go, and he goes. To another, come, and he comes. And to my servant, do this, and he does it. Piper imagines that Jesus' thought probably was engaged by an expression on his face as he began to ponder the words, I am not worthy to have you come under my roof. And I too am a man under authority, with soldiers under me. Perhaps Jesus nodded his head slightly and maybe even chuckled a little. This man indeed was a Roman soldier, a representative of Israel's enemy. And yet, he was the one who understood what even the Jewish elders did in Yechaz. It was indeed something to marvel at. He looked back at the friends and then to the elders. Then he turned and scanned his eyes over his disciples and the small crowd of people had followed them into the city. And he said loud enough for everyone to hear, I'll tell you, not even in Israel have I found such faith. So what in the world had happened to this man known as the centurion in our text? We don't know. <coughs> but here he is in Capernaum, a miracle of God's marvelous grace. And he's a first fruit and a foreshadow of what Jesus had come to bring about. He was a living illustration, according to what Matthew reminds us, that many would come from the east and the west and recline at the table with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob in the kingdom of heaven. I can only imagine what it must have been like that day to be in the crowd. <coughs> the world would have been turned upside down. Jesus crossed boundaries. And I think we all know that when boundaries are crossed, People's toes get stepped on, things sometimes get uncomfortable, and people are challenged. We are talking about something that happens so radical that it would be like what the Reverend Dr. Eric Brodo says about Jesus coming to us today. He invites us to imagine just for a moment that if Jesus walked through the doors of our church and declared that our enemies were more faithful than us. Imagine, he says, just for a moment. Jesus were to declare your oppressors more faithful than you. Imagine for a moment if Jesus declared a terrorist more faithful than you, a criminal more faithful than you. He says this is how shocking Jesus' declaration would have been in his time and day. But I think if we stop and think about it, things aren't all that different today than they were in Jesus' time. We still have our human expectations of who is worthy or unworthy, of who belongs and who doesn't. We still have tensions between faith groups, between ethnic groups. We still have boundaries that we put in place to keep ourselves comfortable. And like the Jewish community that Jesus was a part of, we have our expectations of who Jesus should be with and who Jesus should be. Those expectations probably look very similar to the boundaries that make us comfortable. In other words, like some of the Jewish community then, who may not like it if Jesus crossed boundaries deep with people that we consider our